that while equipping God-breathed word of the Lord, which forms a portion for our sermon text this morning, comes to us from Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 25. At that time, Jesus continued, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from clever and learned people and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, because this was pleasing to you. Everything has been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wants to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. Mercy, grace, and peace are yours through your God and Father and through your Savior, Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. Today is truly an eventful day. Not only is it Super Bowl Sunday, but it is also Groundhog's Day. It's not the rarest occasion that these two days happen to fall on the same date. After all, the Super Bowl is usually the first Sunday in February, and Groundhog's Day is always February 2nd. So it's bound to happen at least sometime. But it's funny how both of these events have become unofficial national holidays. They both draw eyes. First, the eyes were drawn to a little Pennsylvanian town, one Punxsutawney. We all see, we'll see there if the rodent decides he saw his shadow or not. And the next, the eyes will turn to a much larger city, one Miami, Florida. There, two teams will face off to determine who is the champion of the NFL this year. But of course, neither one of these things really matters that much. A strange tradition, isn't it? A groundhog supposedly determining if we're going to have six more weeks of winter or not. And he usually doesn't get it right that Punxsutawney Phil, that groundhog, his track record isn't very great, so it doesn't really matter what he sees or doesn't see anyway. If you happen to be a fan of the two teams who are playing in the big game today, then the day might mean a great deal to you. But neither event really has lasting implications for us. Whether or not Phil sees his shadow will not determine the weather for the next month and a half. Whoever scores the most points tonight doesn't really matter that much to you or me, really, in the long run. Both events, even though they're not important, are wildly speculated on. People like to predict what the groundhog will do. Supposedly, it already happened today. He saw his shadow, I think, which means we're supposed to get six, more week, or six weeks early spring. But people also like to predict what's going to happen in the big game. They like to even wager their hard-earned money on what they think might happen. But even with these events, the wisest of the wise guys cannot tell what's going to happen. It's all pretty arbitrary and random, both outcomes. And again, of course, it doesn't mean much. But there is another event that we are celebrating here today. It is Transfiguration Sunday. You might not have been able to tell that from the scripture readings. Perhaps you could tell that by the banner we have up. But it is appropriate, of course, to have Transfiguration Sunday during the season of Epiphany. After all, this was the ultimate act of revelation. The disciples who were there on the mountain that day with Jesus saw something that no one else had ever seen, at least up to that point. Yet, it was all a sight that all eyes will see someday. They got to glimpse the full power of Christ, and it simply overwhelmed them. What is interesting, though, about our text is we see Jesus' point of view in all of this. Here he talks about his special relationship with his Father in heaven, and what he says is rather revealing. It is information that could not be guessed or predicted. This is the heavenly inside scoop. What is revealed to us here in this text by Jesus 
Well, things that were hidden are revealed. A relationship that we should know nothing about is also revealed. And a rest, a rest that we should have no part of becomes our blessed hope. These are vital things here that are being revealed to us by our Savior, and they are being revealed to us by God himself. And so we pray, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Maker and Redeemer. Amen. To fully grasp the full revelation that is the transfiguration, well, it would be good to go over that event. Before we dive into our text, let us read the account of the transfiguration from the Gospel of Mark. This is Mark chapter 9. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared with, to them with Moses. They were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Those three men, Peter, James, and John, got to see something very special. It was such a glorious event, of course, the only response from the disciples was one from Peter, and he was largely just blabbering on. He didn't know exactly what Jesus said to Moses and Elijah on that mountain, but it had to do with what he was about to accomplish. Then all of a sudden, out of the cloud comes this booming voice, this is my beloved son, hear him. And it was all over. Years later, the apostle Peter would reflect on this in his second epistle, and he would conclude, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. To Peter, an eyewitness of this event, an eyewitness of Jesus' whole ministry, in fact, he knew the things that were revealed by Jesus. He knew that they were truth. Everything that Jesus said, everything that he did was real. And Peter knew that his words, Jesus' words, were to be followed. He knew the seriousness of the word of Christ, and he saw the results firsthand. Yet what Christ's word reveals cannot be comprehended, at least not by conventional wisdom. In our text, it says, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from clever and learned people and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, because this was pleasing to you. What exactly is Jesus referring to here? What are the hidden things? Well, he doesn't necessarily specify, but of course we know what he's talking about. He is, of course, talking about the gospel. But how is the gospel hidden? After all, the Bible is the most printed book, the most published book of all time. Anyone can pick up a copy of the Bible and page through, comb through the pages of it. How is what the Bible talks about, namely that we have a Savior who is both God and man and died for us on the cross, how are those things, the life of Jesus, how is that hidden? Well, they are hidden, and the key to understanding how they are hidden is to first know to whom they are hidden and to whom they are revealed to. 
Here Jesus calls those people to whom these things are hidden, clever, and learned people. Who does that include? Well, I'm sure you could probably think of examples of people who are considered to be clever or learned. Who does the world consider to be clever, learned? Well, scientists, professors, deep thinkers, philosophers. These people try to come up with new explanations to things that God already made known to us in the Bible. These people are strangers to the mystery of the gospel. They try to find a new way to explain what God has plainly explained to us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. What is so shocking about to whom these things have been hidden is the contrast of to whom these things have been revealed to. Who does Jesus say they're revealed to? Little children. Well, who does that include? Well, it's not just a child, but rather whoever has a childlike faith. Indeed, we are these little children that Jesus is talking about. Well, how would you rather be described as a clever and learned person or as someone who is like a little child? Well, probably the former. I like to think that we are learned, that we are smart. But what good does the wisdom of the world really get you? Yes, it may gain you power, wealth, status, but we know all those things can be taken away. The only things which cannot be taken away from us is the things that Jesus is referring to in this text. It is the knowledge that we have been given by faith. It is the knowledge that Jesus suffered, died, paid the full debt that we owed. It is that peace that surpasses all understanding, that peace that doesn't make any sense that we have peace with God. It's not what we deserve. These are the things that only one who has a childlike faith can grasp and understand. This includes everyone here in this church here today. If you know that Jesus is your Savior, then you are truly wiser than the wisest person in the world. Truly, Dar Darwin's origin of species, or Hawking's A Brief History in Time, are dwarfed in the real wisdom displayed by a child singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. Of course, knowing Jesus has implications also. He explains here, Everything has been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wants to reveal him. How is your relationship with your Father? Is it positive? Is it negative? Somewhere in the middle, perhaps? Perhaps your Father is no longer around. Either you are separated by death or some other factor. Relationships with parents can be complicated, and they may be hard to understand if you don't know the dynamic and the history between the father and the child. Well, when it came to Jesus and his relationship to his father, that is, God the Father, they had a very special relationship. When you know who Jesus is, then you start to understand why Jesus and God the Father were so very close. They had a very intimate relationship. That relationship was, of course, the whole reason that Jesus came here in the first place. God asked him to. Jesus was, not, was always about being about his father's business. This was the case when he was a youth, and it was the case during his ministry. In his most crucial and critical moments, Jesus would pray to his father. He didn't just do this, pray to his Father constantly to provide us a good example, even though it is a good example and we should pray to God often. But rather, Jesus prayed to his Father because he considered it vital to have good communication with the Almighty God. Then, of 
course, once you know the full nature of who Jesus was, again, the motive makes sense. After all, Jesus was true God. The fact that the disciples all of a sudden notice very plainly on the Mount of Transfiguration. Sometimes it's hard to understand a relationship between a human child and a human father, but really it is impossible for us to grasp the relationship between Jesus and God the Father. How are you going to understand the interworkings of the triune God? You can't understand how the first person, the second person of the Trinity communicate with each other. But yet it's not important for us to understand this or to explain it. What is important is what that relationship means to us here today. Because Jesus has an intimate relationship with God the Father, so too now do we. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wants to reveal him. That's kind of a confusing proposition that Jesus is offering us here. What exactly is he saying? No one can know Jesus except God the Father? But then no one can know God the Father except God the Son? So then no one can know the Son or the Father? Well, no, of course not. If that was truly the case, we wouldn't be here today. There is an exception. No one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wants to reveal him. Now that's where the third person of the Trinity also steps in. The Holy Spirit is the one who provides us an introduction to the Son, who then in turn provides us an introduction to the Father, brings us to God by faith. The intricate relationship of the one true triune God works and it brings people to him. But what does that intimate relationship really mean? Well, it's pretty clear here what Jesus is saying. You need Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, then you don't know God. If you don't know Jesus, then you don't know grace. If you don't know Jesus, then you don't know true wisdom. These are things that the clever and the learned cannot grasp. They don't know it. The Pharisees, who probably would describe themselves as clever and learned, well, they never saw Jesus for who he truly was. He could only ever just be a threat to their power and some carpenter's son from the north. When, but even, of course, the apostles were skeptical at times. When Philip told his brother Nathaniel about Jesus, his only reaction was, can anything good come from Nazareth? Eventually, they both knew him to be their savior. But the world's reaction to Jesus is largely the same. And what do we hear so often from the world about Jesus today? Oh, well, yeah, I believe Jesus was a person. Certainly, he existed. But he was much different than scripture would have you believe. He was a good man, sure, a great teacher even. But he wasn't the son of God. He did, of course, die on a cross, but he didn't ever perform any miracles. He was just a man. People today love to tell you what you know to be true about Jesus is really fiction. Just turn on the History Channel. There's plenty of documentaries that show, try to show, that the Bible is not accurate in one way, shape, or form, and that it can't be trusted. But we know Jesus to be God, and we know God to be true. Peter said it, he was an eyewitness of Christ's majesty, honor, and glory. When Nathanael did realize that Jesus was the Son of God and confessed it, Jesus told him, Most assuredly I say to you hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus is our God. He is our Savior. And he is how we even know God the Father and have a relationship even with him. On the Mount of Transfiguration, God declared Jesus to be his most beloved son. You can either question that event through your so-called wisdom, or you can take it to be real and take it by faith. What does that relationship that Jesus has with his Father really mean for us? Well, simply put in one word, rest. 
Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. These words spoken by the Savior here, they're so beautiful. How can we not relate to what Jesus is saying here? They say that nothing beats a good night's sleep. I think I have found this to be true, but when I find it to be the most true is when I don't get any sleep at all. You really can take sleep for granted sometimes. Getting regular rest is one of the truly most healthy things you can do for your body. But then when you all of a sudden stop getting the sleep that you need, then you really notice how much a difference good rest really makes. But Jesus provides us with ultimate rest. Yes, there is that rest he has secured for us in heaven, waiting for us, one on the cross. And that, of course, is our ultimate hope in this life. But he also provides rest for your souls here today, right now. He does this by giving us his yoke. Now that concept might be a little strange for us here today as well. More strange than the original audience, I assume. After all, we don't really work much with yokes these days. But the concept was that you'd have a wooden piece, that, a T, that you would put on two different animals, and they both, in turn, would then drive a plow. So what does it mean to be yoked with Christ? Well, it means that he does all the work for you. Jesus fulfilled the law and did literally all the work for us. When we are yoked with Jesus, he brings us to God. Because we have this special relationship with Christ, we can bear anything that this world could possibly throw at us ever. No longer do we bear the guilt of all the wrong that we have done, all the misdeeds that we have committed in this lifetime. No, it's all been forgiven by Jesus Christ. And this is true rest. Any load that has ever been on our shoulders, when you take it to Christ, it is promptly and permanently removed. He is gentle, he says here, and he is humble in heart. When Peter saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain, well, he started saying things that were nonsensical. That is what witnessing the full power of Christ will do to you. It's truly terrifying. Yet, even though he is true God, which is a terrifying thought to any sinner, or at least it should be, that is not how Jesus comes to us. He came to earth and took on our flesh and our blood. He comes to us like one of us, because he is one of us. He can relate to you because he is like you. He was a man, but he was also God and has power and authority to do anything. How can our burdens ever be too much for us to take to him? How can we ever have problems too big that the almighty, all-powerful Lord cannot handle them? Yes, today is quite the day. There are events going on in this world that some people would consider to be important, and I'm sure there'll be events going on in the world that are important to people tomorrow and the next day. But our day-to-day -day lives are different now, for we wear the yoke of Christ. Our burden are heavy, of course, because we go through this life stumbling. But the difference is we know where to go when we have these burdens. We can always go to Jesus. He removes the load. We receive the real rest that only he could ever provide. He is the son of God and he brings us to God. He reveals things to us that no one could ever know or understand and yet we do and we know it by faith. He reveals to us true rest, rest from our sins, and rest with him forever in heaven. Amen.
please rise.